What is her story? What is his story? These are two questions I want us to walk away from remembering today with this sermon. Most of us probably remember this book in 1989 being released and sweeping across the country, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from Stephen Covey. Most people could probably remember at least a few of the habits. Think, win, win, be proactive. Yet there is one habit that our country has glossed over. And it's unfortunate because this is some of the greatest modern day advice that we could be using today. And that is habit number five. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Imagine how many marriages would be saved if we practiced that. Imagine how many family relationships would be restored if we practice that. And even more importantly, imagine where the harmony level of our country would be today if we first seek to understand, then to be understood. I'm probably going to step on some toes with my next statement, and I do it in a loving fashion because my toes were stepped on and it was done lovingly as well. When it comes to your views, when it comes to your thoughts, and when it comes to your perspective, you may not be wrong, but I'm going to be bold and tell you, you are not completely right. Having a perspective is not our challenge. A willingness to broaden our perspective is a challenge. A willingness to listen to others' perspective is our challenge. Our sermon series over the next five weeks is titled Wintering Through the Biblical Tools for the Hardest Part of the Journey. And the intent is to name, explore, and employ attributes that provide resiliency for our lives. This week, we will be discussing perspective. I've been teaching on perspective for many years and mentoring on perspective for many years. And I use the analogy of this brass bell to get across my point of perspective. And when I do this presentation, I'll usually bring up a, uh, two individuals, person A and person B, and they represent two of the most highly respected groups of people in our country. And I will ask them both, are we in agreement that this is a brass bell? And of course, both say yes. I'll ask, would you guys both agree that this is made of some type of metal? And they both agree. And I will then ask, do we not agree that it makes some type of loud sound? And yes, again, we're all in agreement. Yet when I ask person A, are they willing to ring the bell? They emphatically say, no way. And then when I ask person B, are you willing to ring the bell? They are excited to ring the bell. Why is this? We all agree what this bell is and what this bell does. And unless we understand each one of their stories, we will never be on the same page and they will never be on the same page. See, person A represents Navy SEAL trainees. And when a Navy SEAL trainee decides to quit, they have to ring the bell. And this bell means failure to them. Yet when I ask person B if they want to ring the bell, they represent a cancer survivor. And when a cancer survivor makes it to the end of their treatment, they get to ring the bell because it represents success. The same bell Two completely different meanings, and yet both are correct. However, if, again, each one does not know their story, they will never be on the same page. Today, I invite you to join me in reading the scripture from chapter 3 of John's book, where Nicodemus is being witnessed to by Jesus. He says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, 
Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? In other words, he's saying, are you not the teacher, the expert, and yet you do not understand what I'm saying to you? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we dive into here with Nicodemus and we take a look at who this gentleman is and his background. And what we see is that he is labeled as a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin assemblies. This is the highest legal, legislative, and judicial body of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. He's also seen as a religious figure, a philosopher, and a teacher. But more importantly, he is seen and believes himself to be an expert of the coming Messiah. Hear me, I said an expert of the coming Messiah. Yet, take a look at Nicodemus's perspective on the Messiah. Who was he expecting? He was expecting a warrior. The common notion that the Messiah's kingdom was a political kingdom, not a heavenly kingdom. His nation would be freed from Roman domination. Yet what was he hearing and seeing? He was hearing and seeing a loving rabbi producing miraculous godly signs. He had this internal conflict from what he was educated on to what he was witnessing and seeing in person. So what did he do? He role modeled for us what we should be doing and yet we seem to fail to do. We seem to fail to understand and go ask what is a person's story when they have a different perspective than ours. Nicodemus said, what is his story? And this is where he separates himself from our typical initial responses. He goes and finds out Jesus' story. He takes action. He's intentional. He has a sense of humility and is willing to expose himself to the possibilities of not being completely right. So Jesus gets to witness to Nicodemus. And when Nicodemus goes to Jesus, he has this internal conflict Yet he acknowledges rabbi, he acknowledges Jesus as a teacher. And he notices and says that I realize you must be a man of God because only a man of God can do these miraculous signs. And what is interesting, Jesus instantly reads Nicodemus' internal conflict and cuts right to his internal questions. He does not even give Nicodemus a chance to ask. And Jesus says to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This word again, this is their brass bell. This is where their perspectives see the same word, but are different. See, the Greek word for again is anathen, and it actually has two meanings. The word means again, And it also means from above. So Nicodemus, when he hears Jesus use the word anathen, he's coming from an earthly perspective. And here's the word again, which is why he follows up with Jesus and asks, how can one be physically born again? Yet Jesus 
is using the word anathen from above, meaning from heavenly perspective, which is why he then speaks about spirit and water. We're fortunate because we get to see Nicodemus's progression. Because right here during this part of the story we read, Nicodemus is not on the same page as Jesus. Yet further along in John's writing in chapter 7, we get to see that the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, threatened by Jesus' teachings, tried to have him arrested. Why? Because he does not match their perspective of who the coming Messiah was. And they wanted to silence him. Does this not sound too familiar today? So Nicodemus stands up for Jesus, but not directly defending Jesus, but reminding the Pharisees that there are laws in place to handle situations like this. And isn't it interesting that the moment the Pharisees' perspective of the coming Messiah is threatened, he doesn't fit their mold. The very people who were so well known for outwardly displaying rule-obeying We're willing to break the rules. Does that not sound too familiar today? Fortunately, we get to read one more time about Nicodemus in John chapter 19. And what is so cool is, not only is there evidence of Nicodemus learning about Jesus' story, now there is evidence of him becoming part of his story. Because Nicodemus helps with the burial of Jesus, our Savior. So Nicodemus was willing to ask, what is his story? And his soul is now benefiting for eternity because he was willing to ask that question. Why are we so focused on outward conformity? Why is it other people must conform to our beliefs our way of doing things, our social groups, before we are even willing to listen to their story, before we're even willing to entertain their thoughts. On October 21st in 2012, my perspective on how to love my girls was transformed. My former pastor, Bob Thompson, a man who I absolutely respect dearly, role modeled for me what a man's love is to look like, and what God's grace looks like. Anyone who spends any time getting to know my story and spends just a little bit of time with me instantly picks up on two things. One, I am insanely disciplined. And two, my girls, Amy and my two daughters, are my greatest earthly gifts So when Pastor Bob speaks on love and parenting, I'm all in and I am listening. On this day, his sermon was appropriately titled, God Prefers Imperfect Intimacy to Outward Conformity. Please hear this again. God prefers imperfect intimacy to outward conformity. See, during this time, Pastor Bob was writing a book on humility And he went to his adult children to ask them about their perspectives and thoughts and views on his parenting skills, about them being raised. And he was, no doubt, a great dad. But he was very surprised to learn when they opened up to him and said, Dad, we never saw you cry. Dad, we never saw you and mom argue. So we never learned how to resolve conflict. And what hit him the most was when they let him know that you seemed more like a professional Christian than someone I can be real with. What was missing? Well, it was revealed to him what was missing was intimacy, imperfect intimacy. And isn't that what our Savior wants? When we become adopted members of God's family, He is pursuing us. He's pursuing us right where we are. It does not matter how sinful we are, how mature or immature we are. He wants and pursues for a relationship of intimacy, even if it's one of imperfect intimacy. 
I kind of apply this to Old Testament versus New Testament. Old Testament has this strong flavor of outward conformity. You do this and this will happen. Where Jesus comes along in the New Testament and he is all about that imperfect intimacy. He wants that relationship with us regardless of where we are and what we're doing. God prefers imperfect intimacy to outward conformity. So, the next time you see someone wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, hold off and ask, what is his story? What is her story? Or maybe you realize that they're a Republican or they're a Democrat. Refrain. Don't make a quick judgment call and ask, what is his story? What is her story? Maybe they have socialist leanings, conservative leanings. Stop and ask, what is his story? What is her story? Or God forbid, do I say, you learn that they are a Dallas Cowboys fan. Okay, well, that's the one exception. You don't have to ask these two questions. No, but really, we need to get into the practice of asking, what is her story? What is his story? Are we not fortunate and blessed to know that God prefers imperfect intimacy to outward conformity? Thanks be to God.